Crime Cafe, where the subjects of the day are crime, suspense, and thrills. And my name is Debbie Mack. So uh, let's get started. Um, I'm talking to uh, author Jenny Melchman, who is truly, in my opinion, an exceptional author. Uh, I have to say, before you say a word, Jenny, the first time I saw your short stories, I said, I know this woman is going places. Wow. <laughs> so um, when you got your book contract, I wasn't at all surprised and I was thoroughly pleased. And I've read uh, Cover of Snow, which was your debut novel uh, com that was released in 2013, I believe. Yep. And I, I gotta tell you, it feels like it was yesterday. <laughs> and um, I'm reading now Ruin Falls and your your story, it's like you go in this whole different direction, yet the uh, thread of, I think it's Weed Skull, am I cr pronouncing that correctly? Yeah, you're one of the few people who did. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so that that thread of weed skull and the uh, the mountains of upstate New York runs through it. Yeah. Um, what was it that made you decide to write stories about that area? I mean, I love that area. We have some very interesting kind of near miss stories in that area, but without getting into all of that, which which I'm happy to tell people sometime, like the honeymoon that wasn't or, or some of our other funnier stories. You know, the Adirondacks are just a very dramatic area. I mean, there's six million acres within the Blue Line, which is the Adirondack Park. That's a lot of space, you know, to get lost in, to die in, to run into trouble in. And that's what happens in my stories. Um, the weather is also very dramatic in upstate New York, and weather figures in a lot to both my books. I know. And that. into the. Um, yes, yes. It's hard not to. Yeah. Um... It's uh, also the area where um, stories like Washington Irving's took place. Well, them. so that's actually close to where I'm living now. It's a little south of the Adirondacks. Uh -huh. But yet, you know, there's a softer feel, I feel like, to Washington Irving's territory. The mountains are kind of more rounded and older. The Adirondacks is, you know, it's still on the cusp of a new place geographically and ge uh, geologically. And, there, and another thing that really interests me about the Adirondacks and Washington Irving country is that new people are moving in in an incredibly rapid rate. And so you have this clash of the old timers who have lived there for generations and know how to do things and, and maybe have no other choice but to live in this kind of hard scrabble country. And then people who are coming in and opening their sustainable diners and their expensive boutiques. And, and there's a real clash of cultures that, that kind of interests me up here. That is interesting. A clash of the townies, as it were, the old timers right. and the newcomers. Exactly. You see that a lot around the country in, in different areas. Yeah. College you towns, do. small towns. You do. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And it's always it all and it produces drama. And so for a suspense writer, you know, there's a lot of potential there. Absolutely. Um, what authors or events have inspired you to write your particular books? Well, I have to say that whenever anybody asks me this question, they are surprised by my answer. But Stephen King is the biggest influence on me. I just, I think he's brilliant. I argued with my parents when I was 12 years old to be allowed to read King. And they said I'd be too scared. And I swore that I wouldn't. And they eventually gave in. And I wasn't. Um, I just, I love his work. I think he's a master of character. I feel like Stephen King, you know, somebody can walk onto the into the story for a paragraph and you remember that character forever so Stephen King definitely and you know the same answer I think a lot of writers would give or or I would give anyway which is that you know I was lonely as a child and I was shy and and didn't fit in that well and I retreated into stories both the ones I read and the ones I created in my mind. Um, you know, my mom tells this uh, memory of us driving up to Canada when I was maybe three or four, really young. It's an 18-hour drive, and I was quiet almost the whole time. And at one point, she turned around and said, well, what are you doing back there? And I said, I was making up the story. So it bit young. The Sounds bug familiar. bit young. Yeah, does it? <laughs> I used to do the same kind of things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what authors do when they're younger. Um, Absolutely. So tell us about your uh, upcoming book, As Night Falls. Okay, so this is what I have to tell all you news hounds and even people who are not news hounds. As Night Falls concerns two prisoners who escape 
from an Adirondack prison. And if you have, yes, put on CNN or really any channel, right, we know that there are two prisoners who escaped from an Adirondack prison and are uh, on the loose up there. So I have to first say a heartfelt prayer that law enforcement will bring these people to justice safely, that there will not be any, you know, terrible outcome. But in my book, As Night Falls, there is, of course, not a terrible outcome, but a terrible premise. And the escapees find their way to an isolated home. And inside that home is a family. Um, and it could be your typical, you know, bad guys break in story, except that there's a connection between one of the bad guys and one of the women who turns out to live in the home. And that connection is kind of the story behind the story. Oh the whole place, goodness. the whole book takes place in one night, eight hours long. So it was the fastest timetable I'd ever, yeah, ever wrote. Those are good stories. You know, when you impose that kind of time limit, right. they, they're really taut. They're really suspenseful. I hope so. See, I wasn't conscious of it at all. It was just that this situation could not last too long. I mean, there's there's three people in the house and a rescue dog, and they're going to fight with everything they've got, including the rescue dog who's who's got a phobia. The rescue dog actually cannot be on his own. Um, my dog, Mac, is based on a bookstore dog that I met on one of my book tours um, who had the same phobia. And so the bookstore dog goes with her owners to the bookstore every day because she can't be on her own. She was traumatized as a puppy. She's fine, the sweetest dog you could imagine, but she needs other people around her. And I found that so inspiring. What would happen if there was a dog who was isolated and couldn't stand it? And would that dog become a hero? And 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 Mac does, I am happy to say. But anyway, so the story can't last very long because there's four people fighting for their lives in the family. Um, so yes, eight hours, and it just turned out to work that way. Well, it sounds very, very interesting, and I can't wait for it to come out. Thank you. Uh, has being a published author been what you expected it would be? Oh, gosh, what a good question. I have to sit here silently for a while before I answer that. You know, yes and no, um, and in some ways better than I ever thought it would be, and in some ways worse. You know, I think one of the illusions I had, because it took me a very long time to get published, and you know that, Debbie, because we interacted at many points along the way, but maybe not everyone listening does, but it took me 11 years before my first novel got published, and that was really my eighth, the eighth book I had written. Um, and so I think when something takes that long, you sort of build up this illusion or delusion that everything will be perfect once it happens. You know, the book will come out, and then everybody in the world will know I'm a writer. Even people who don't read will know I'm a writer. And everywhere I go, they'll be like, oh, you write beautiful books, and yay, aren't you wonderful? And that doesn't really happen. I mean, the truth is that even when you're with a big house, which is, you know, kind of what I was hanging in there for 11 years for, you know, nobody really knows you're a writer. And, you know, you're, if you're lucky, your editors kind of know you're a writer. And a few select people like Debbie who read my short story. But it's a lot of work. And I think that was a big surprise for me, that the work doesn't start when that – the work doesn't end when that book comes out. And it's not just writing the next book. Everything starts then. Um, and so – and, and and you know, and the better part, the part I didn't realize but should have – is that connecting with readers one by one by one is so much joy that you almost don't need the people who don't read books to know you're a writer. You know, it's good enough just to meet somebody who says, hey, I'm really glad you hung in there for 11 years because your book, you know, the first book concerned suicide, as you know. And I've had a bunch of people, more than I would have thought, who said I lost someone in my family to suicide. And then I always sort of cringe and say, I'm sorry. I I wrote this and they said, no, you know, seeing Nora and how she dealt with it and that she did some of the same things I did was so reassuring. Um, so, you know, those have been some of the joys that I never would have expected. That's fantastic. Yeah. I noticed in your guest post, you emphasize the importance of signings. How, how do you kind of gauge the effect of signings on your, I guess, overall marketing efforts? Well, first of all, I don't do it by book sales. And I think that's very, very important. I think authors get really disappointed when they go to a signing and, you know, sell five books. You know, I went all the way out here and I made whatever it is, you know, 
ten dollars if you're traditionally published, fifty dollars if you're indie published, maybe. And I think that's the exact wrong approach because the real benefit of a signing is what happens after you leave the the place. You know, whether you're at a bookstore or a library and the coordinators of the event are going to go now know your name and know your work and hopefully read your work, or whether somebody in your audience, you know, I did an event where there was exactly one person, exactly one. We talked for two hours um, and it was wonderful and I was not even, you know, upset because when I do, I do such long book tours that you can handle an event, you know, if I'd maybe flown into the city for it, it would have been disappointing, but I didn't. We drove and it was quite a fun night, but only at the very end did I find out that this one person was a reviewer for a major paper in the area and had never known my work before. So, you know, I don't know how to, to answer your question, I don't know how to gauge the effect. I don't. But my gut and my, I'm trying to tap my chest here, my heart says that the effect is long term and impossible to measure. And if you love it, you know, if you love the connecting with people, do it as often as possible because you, you literally never know when there will be that needle tipping, life changing event. And even if it's not necessarily making you sell 50 million books, you know, you're having so much fun along the way that I at least feel like it's worth it. I actually, I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. Um, I get a little discouraged sometimes listening to other writers talk about how, oh, you know, I, I do, I used to do more book signings, et cetera, et cetera, but now it just seems like it's not financially worth it. You know, they worry about the travel costs and so right. on, and, and who can blame them? Yeah. But at the same time, that connection with readers is so, it's wonderful, and it's yes. so, as you said, fun. Yes. And... Um, I also know that you are a strong uh, proponent of bookstores. Yeah, I love and bookstores. Things like take your child to a bookstore day. Yeah. Uh, tell us how you got involved in that. Well, I mean, related to being the kind of kid we were talking about, bookstores were my salvation. I couldn't afford a lot of books when I was a kid. I got most of my books from the library. But I grew up in a town that was not, you know, a huge town but still had four independent bookstores. It now has two. Um, and I would go there, you know, and I would sit in the aisles and know that I couldn't afford to buy a book, but the bookseller would be okay with that. And just read and lose myself and, you know, escape whatever troubles of the day I had. And so when I had children, you know, kind of almost intuitively, like instinctively, you crawl back. And I brought my kids to the bookstore. We went to Story Hour. And at a certain point, so much was in the news about, bookstores closing and bookstores dying that I really wanted to explore this. I mean, this did not seem to be the case from the bookstores I was frequenting. And we went out on the road and indeed it's not the case. Um, you know, there are bookstores opening in greater numbers over the past five years and people are there. I mean, I've been at bookstores in some pretty odd hours and they're full. There are lines at the register. And so I did start Take Your Child to a Bookstore Day because I just wanted you know, I wanted to sort of ceremonialize the idea that kids and bookstores are a magic combination. That's wonderful. And um, I, I also am a big fan of bookstores. I love them. And I'm glad to hear, you know, it's good to see that so many of them are actually popping up now. And um, on that note, I have to ask you, what is the most bizarre thing that's ever happened to you at a book signing? Oh, gosh. So everybody has a strange That's book signing. That's a good question. <laughs> well, there was the book signing where somebody raised her hand and asked me how much I earned, which took me a little bit aback. But that's not the most <laughs> I mean, that was, that was a crazy question. It was hard to answer because I actually don't even know. What's the most bizarre thing? <sighs> it would be good if, like, somebody, like, you know, stripped down at a book signing and, you know, had gotten a tattoo or something, like weed skill on their neck or something. But no, nothing has happened like that. See, I want to make something up because I'm a writer. I guess I'll tell a heartwarming story, actually, which is that I went to Goshen, Indiana, which is a tiny, tiny little town and a bookstore called Better World Books. And there was one person at this event, too. Everybody who's listening is going to think I have the one-person event. Mm -hmm. um, and we also spent two hours talking. And the difference was that at the end of this book event, this fellow did not buy a book, which, again, because I don't measure it by book sales, doesn't necessarily 
upset me for myself, but I felt terrible for the bookseller because you could tell they were disappointed by the turnout. They'd put a lot into the event, you know, really set up the event space so it looked very nice. And now nobody, you know, the person wasn't even buying a book. So I, I begged him to buy Nancy Picard's Scent of Rain and Lightning, which is a book that I recommend everywhere. I didn't even, I didn't have to beg him. I just said, you should buy this book. This is the one that we've been discussing tonight. So he did. So I felt better for the bookseller. So now we're standing at the door and the bookseller's just itching. I mean, the poor lady, like, you know, it's like a half an hour past closing time. And the man says to me, look, I want to tell you why I didn't buy your book tonight. And the reason is that I already own three copies. And he said, I have one that I read, one that I lend, and one that I keep pristine. I don't let anybody touch. And I said, well, you know, that's why I came to Goshen, Indiana, because, oh, and then he said, and I better leave now because I have a three-hour drive home. And I was like, you know, if I described in a marketing plan that I want to go to Goshen because one guy there is going to decide that Jenny Milchman is worth driving three hours for, you know, the publisher is going to say, that's nice, honey, but we, we can't afford that kind of marketing plan. But for me, you know, it's a moment I never forgot. So Yeah. Our, I, yeah. That has to just, that would blow me away if somebody had told me that. And it did. It did. It's a hallmark of Jenny's uh, support for other authors that she told the guy, buy the Nancy Picard's book. You have all always been so supportive of other authors, and that is something that I know I personally pre appreciate very much. <laughs> oh, I'm glad. I mean, the thing that is neat is that the book landscape is so rich that we can all support each other's work. I mean, I've seen I people know. talk about your books, Debbie, and say, you know, legal thrillers, and, and, you know, this is the most interesting thing that I've ever seen in your character. I hope you're going to repeat this character and stuff. And I think that's amazing because Debbie can do that, and that's not something I can do you know somebody who gets turned on to your work because you do a made it moment on my blog it's not like they're not going to buy a book that i would recommend or a book that i would write i mean there's just more than enough to go around so yeah. i agree totally yeah well i think we're running out of time but i just want to say thank you so much for being a guest on the show thank you for and having me absolutely and if you haven't read her guest blog post it is on my blog at crimecafe.net just go to that uh, email address or you know url whatever crimecafe.net and click on blog it will essentially take you to my website and her guest post is on my blog uh, and uh, the other thing i was going to mention is that uh, not only is jenny doing a giveaway of one of her books the one coming up as night falls but I am doing a, uh, a sale on uh, a package uh, from which all authors who will be interviewed on the show will contribute. And everybody's contributing novels. Um, some people have nonfiction that they're contributing, short stories. It's going to be a whole package. And I'm going to offer it at a reasonable, reasonable price, which I will determine after the package is put together. Because right now, packages are still, you know, uh, contributions are still coming in. <laughs> That's so, so exciting. To, that's a cool exciting. idea. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm thrilled to, to be able to have this opportunity to do this. So, um, so everybody next week, I promise you there will be more information about that and I will give you the information that you need to uh, buy this package. Uh, but Jenny Milchman will have a, it's a short story, isn't it? One of your it is, and it's the very first published piece I ever had. So that's what I wanted to contribute. It's how Debbie and I, you know, first kind of intersected paths. Yeah, and it's really good. <laughs> I remember when I read it and I thought, wow, this is good. <laughs> so um, Thank you. very suspenseful and you just, your writing just shown. So um, thank you very much for being here today. And uh, I will be talking to you hopefully sometime in the future. And as for you people out there listening, I hope you'll check in every week to the Crime Cafe or every other week. I'm doing this every other week. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> this is the first time I've ever done this. No. <laughs> every other week I'll you be... You seem quite prepared. Do I? My gosh. Yeah. It's amazing. It seems like a polished, it seems like a polished show. So I think you're going to have fun at the Crime Cafe. Thank you for having me. Thank Debbie. you very much. And talk to you later. Thank you.